Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 80, Space Shuttle Flight 13, STS-41G. Radiation, radar, and real hydrazine. Last time, we covered the flight of STS-41D. Discovery's career started off in dramatic fashion with the shuttle program's first RSLS abort, where the computer quickly shut down the still-igniting space shuttle main engines before the SRBs were commanded to light. A malfunctioning fuel valve kept Discovery and its crew earthbound on that attempt, but OV-103 made its first flight a couple of months later and enjoyed a completely successful mission. It even solved the mystery of some Ohm's pod damage observed on STS-41B when an icicle was observed growing off of the water dump nozzles. Discovery touched down six days after liftoff, and attention turned to the next flight on the docket, STS-41G. When the crew of Discovery returned home, it was to an increasingly crowded astronaut office. That's because a few months before their flight, a new group of astronaut candidates had been selected by NASA. Yes, I forgot to mention this last time. Can't win them all. Chosen in May of 1984, astronaut group 10, who had the dubious nickname The Maggots, got in line behind around 80 of their colleagues. With so many missions being planned at such a rapid tempo, plenty of astronauts were going to be needed in order to keep things running smoothly. We won't be seeing any of this group for a little while, but let's at least introduce them in the traditional The Space Above Us rapid-fire data dump fashion. As always, please excuse any mispronunciations, but feel free to shoot me a correction email at jp at thespaceabove.us. From the piloting side of things, we've got Kenneth Cameron, John Casper, Frank Culbertson, Sidney Gutierrez, Blaine Hammond Jr., Mike McCulley, and Jim Weatherby. From the mission specialist side, James Adamson, Ellen Baker, Mark Brown, Sonny Carter Jr., Marsha Ivins, Mark Lee, David Lowe, Bill Shepard, Catherine Thornton, and Charles Veach. In all, that 17 new astronaut candidates who soon dove into training on the basics of spaceflight. We'll see them again in a few years. Flying on this mission would be a number of scientific payloads, including one satellite deployment, that satellite was the Earth Radiation Budget Satellite, or ERBS. When I say Earth Radiation Budget Satellite, it's a satellite studying the Earth's radiation budget, not some sort of cheapo model of spacecraft being sold as an Earth Radiation Budget Satellite. Though it was built with the same standardized MMS bus as the Solar Max mission, so maybe it was a budget satellite as well. I didn't check. The radiation budget was an important thing to understand as more and more research was being done on the globe's climate, which even back in 1984 seemed to be shifting. Basically, the radiation budget is the difference between the amount of energy absorbed by the planet versus how much is emitted back up into space. Every day, the Earth basks in the light, or radiation, of the sun, which warms it up. At the same time, it emits energy in the form of heat and reflected light back out into space. Scientists wanted to know exactly how much was being emitted compared to how much was staying with us, keeping the planet warm and driving climate patterns. To accomplish this, ERBS had a number of sensitive radiometers that were deployed around the spacecraft. These radiometers would watch the sun to see how much energy was coming out of it, as well as the part of the Earth that it was flying over, so that it could see how much energy was just going right back out into space. Together, the radiometers made up the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment, which was made up of two parts. One was scanned back and forth, and the other was stationary. So they were creatively named the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment Scanner, and the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment Non-Scanner. Joining these two instruments was the Stratospheric Aerosol and Gas Experiment, or SAGE-2. The 2 is there because an earlier version had flown on another satellite. This instrument peered down from its lofty perch and, using some sort of science magic, determined the makeup of the upper atmosphere. It was able to make big contributions to the understanding and management of the ozone hole and how stuff like volcanic eruptions impact the climate. ERBS was actually part of a larger team of satellites, though it was the only one fully focused on the Earth's radiation budget. 
Both NOAA 9 and NOAA 10, Earth Observing Spacecraft from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration and NASA Best Friend for Life, carried their own radiation budget instruments. Their inclusion was important since they were in highly inclined orbits flying over the poles, while ERBS, with its 57 degree inclination, was better able to cover the area around the equator. STS 41G would fly with a crew of seven which was then the largest spaceflight crew to date, but which went on to become the most common crew size for the shuttle program. It also included the first Canadian to fly in space, the first launch of a person with a beard, and the first spaceflight to include two women. Commanding the mission would be our good buddy Bob Crippen. If it feels like we just saw Cripp, you're right. He commanded STS-41C less than six months ago. His command of this mission was actually a bit of a test, to see if it was feasible to add the commander several months after the rest of the crew had already started training. I would imagine that this overlap would leave a capable commander with more time to fly missions instead of redoing training that they're already familiar with. It also allows the crew to grow a bit on their own before the boss rolls in. And with someone as talented and experienced as Crippen, this test was a safe way to feel out the shortest reasonable turnaround time for an astronaut. Though nobody knew it at the time, this would be Crippen's last of four space flights. In the aftermath of the Challenger accident, he would take on a managerial role in an effort to promote more people with hands-on ops experience. We know Crip from STS-1, STS-7, STS-41C, and now STS-41G, and bid him a fond farewell. Flying alongside Crip would be pilot John McBride. John McBride was born on August 14, 1943, in Charleston, West Virginia. He attended West Virginia University for four years, but doesn't seem to have earned a degree there. I guess the allure of flight was just too much to resist, because instead he began flight training with the Navy. Don't worry though, he'll loop back later and earn a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. Before that though, he became a fighter pilot flying 64 combat missions in Southeast Asia at the helm of an F-4 Phantom II. After that, he attended test pilot school at Edwards before moving on to serve in Development Squadron 4 at Point Mugu, California, where he was a maintenance officer and a project officer for the Sidewinder missile. He was still there performing in air shows in addition to his normal work when he joined NASA in 1978. This is his only spaceflight, but not for lack of trying. He was actually scheduled to command STS-61E, which was cancelled after the Challenger accident. Like Cripp, he then moved into a managerial role in an effort to create a management layer that was more integrated with the folks flying the missions. He was actually offered command of STS-35 in 1990, but instead retired from NASA pursuing business interests. Before we get to the mission specialists, can I just say that I have to admit I've been caught off guard by the long shadow cast by the Challenger accident backwards in time. I obviously expected it to be one of the most pivotal moments of the entire program, but I did not anticipate just how many times I would have to mention its influence seemingly on every flight. So I guess I unintentionally taught myself the lesson that I've tried to weave into the show that spaceflight events are not isolated pieces of data in a history book, but are part of an interwoven and ongoing process. Moving back on the flight deck, we find Mission Specialist 1, Kathy Sullivan. Catherine Sullivan was born on October 3, 1951 in Patterson, New Jersey, though she grew up in California. She earned a bachelor's degree in Earth Sciences from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a Ph.D. in geology from Dalhousie University, making her the first geologist to fly in space since we saw Jack Schmidt back on Apollo 17. Sullivan spent some of her time as an exchange student in Norway, which I'm sure is basically just one big playground to a geologist. As we will soon see, one of her many claims to fame is that she was the first American woman to perform an EVA. This is her first of three space flights. Flying as Mission Specialist 2 was robot arm extraordinaire Sally Ride. We know Ride from her flight on STS-7. And this is Ride's last of two flights, with her departing NASA in 1987 to return to Stanford, joining the Center for International Security and Arms Control. 
And last but not least for the main crew, Mission Specialist 3, Dave Liestma. David Liestma was born on May 6, 1949 in Muskegon, Michigan. He earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's degree, also in aeronautical engineering, from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School a year later. With the Navy, he learned how to fly the F-14, serving in a variety of roles, including flying on the aircraft carrier USS John F. Kennedy. He moved on to Air Test and Evaluation Squadron 4 at Point Mugu, California. Hey, I wonder if he knew John McBride. While in California, Leastma tested and evaluated a bunch of upgrades for the F-14, including software and avionics. He joined NASA in 1980, and this is his first of three flights. Joining the main crew were two payload specialists. Payload specialist one was Paul Scully Power. Paul Scully Power was born on May 28, 1944 in Sydney, Australia. He earned a variety of degrees in... something involving math, I'm not entirely sure. Usually for these segments, I lean pretty heavily on the official biographies on NASA's website and in the press kits. But for Mr. Scully Power here, it's sort of cryptic, so I'm just going to read it verbatim. Quote, He attended schools in London and Sydney, Australia and received a postgraduate diploma of education and honors in applied mathematics. So there you go. Scully Power's own little claim to fame is that he is the first person to launch into space with a beard. We've seen some crews come back home with a beard, such as the guys on Skylab 4, but NASA typically made crews shave before liftoff to ensure that the helmet formed a proper seal. Scully Power told NASA engineers to bring it on and prove that he could make the helmet seal properly no matter what scenarios they came up with. So the beard stayed. Scully Power was an expert oceanographer and would be spending most of his time looking out the window for the sorts of phenomenon that automated spacecraft wouldn't know to look for, such as spiral eddies. This is his only spaceflight. And finally, payload specialist 2, Mark Garneau. Mark Garneau was born on February 23, 1949 in Quebec City, Canada. He earned a bachelor's degree in engineering physics from the Royal Military College of Kingston and a doctorate in electrical engineering from the Imperial College of Science and Technology in London. He bounced around the Canadian Navy for a number of years working on weapons systems, simulators, and some sort of airborne target system for training. In 1983, he became one of six Canadians chosen to fly as payload specialists. And since he's lucky number one, he becomes the first Canadian to fly in space. His role on this flight would be to perform a number of experiments provided by the National Research Council of Canada studying space technology, space science, and life sciences. This is his first of three flights, but his only flight as a payload specialist. In 1992, he'll upgrade to full-on mission specialist. Alright, that was a lot of details on the crew. Don't worry, as we start getting further into the program, we should start seeing more spaceflight vets, so this section will be a little shorter. However, if you were thinking the opposite and can't get enough, I'd recommend the book Before Liftoff by Henry Cooper Jr. Cooper was a reporter embedded with the crew throughout their training, and it gives a great insight into what day-to-day life was like for an astronaut at this time in the program's history. I guess just to stick it to the STS-41D crew, STS-41G took off on the first try with no delays, no extra holds, and no scrubs, right at 7.03 a.m. Eastern Time on October 5th, 1984. A few minutes of powered flight later, and Challenger and its crew found themselves in a 350 by 355 kilometer orbit, inclined 57 degrees to the equator. First on the agenda, only nine hours into the flight, deploying herbs. The various appendages on herbs made it too big to fit back into the payload bay once deployed, and were not retractable, so it was important to run a pre-check before popping open the solar arrays and antennas. Ground controllers could communicate directly with the satellite via a data umbilical cable that connected it to the orbiter, so they'd be able to take one last look and make sure everything looked good. Once they were satisfied, they would give the go-ahead to the crew to move on to the next phase. Operating the remote manipulator system, Sally Ride grappled herbs and held it up above the payload bay so that the folks at Goddard could issue the commands to pop open the solar array and antenna and check out the newly deployed hardware before releasing the spacecraft. But that's when we hit our first hitch. 
ground controllers informed Ride that she should now see the solar arrays deploying. Ride informed the ground controllers that, no, not so much. The solar arrays were right where they started. Hinges are actually sort of a tricky business in space. It's not uncommon for them to get stuck. So what to do? I bet you're thinking that these ultra-talented astronauts in their multi-billion dollar spacecraft supported by some of the finest engineers in the world have some sort of whiz-bang plan up their sleeves, right? <laughs> nah, Ride just wiggled it back and forth with the robot arm. Between the wiggling and exposing the hinges to the sun to warm them up, something eventually worked, and the solar arrays popped into place. After a couple of other minor software hitches, Ride released herbs to fly on its own. The tip-off rate, the spin imparted by the robot arm, was less than 0.01 degrees per second. Not too shabby. Herbs eventually raised its orbit to 650 kilometers, where it began a mission that was planned to last at least two years, but went on to last 21 years, finally being decommissioned in 2005. Folks on the ground were eager to get herbs deployed, since the following item on the agenda was to deploy the next experiment that we'll be talking about, Shuttle Imaging Radar B, or SIR-B. SIR-B was a large flat antenna made up of three parts that unfolded into a rectangle, 7 feet wide and 35 feet long, so it took up a big chunk of the payload bay. SIR-B would, as the name implies, use radar to image the ground. It emitted radio waves, which bounced off the ground and were collected with the antenna, revealing all sorts of interesting information. Radar imaging is super cool because it basically just ignores stuff like weather, looking right through it. It can even peer a few feet underground, unearthing stuff like ancient villages and dried up rivers. Sir B was actually an upgraded version of an experiment that flew in the back of Columbia on STS-2. The new model was slightly larger, which led to higher resolution, and could swivel side to side so that it could look at stuff that wasn't directly under the orbiter. That also meant that it could look at the same area on the ground from two different angles, allowing 3D reconstructions to be made. Sir B had over 40 investigators from all over the world involved, who were all anxiously watching the herbs deployment since the radar antenna could not deploy until the satellite was gone. Once the payload bay was free, though, deployment went nice and smoothly, even if the somewhat floppy antenna elicited some concern from the crew. The plan was to collect some data over the next day or so, then fold the antenna back up again so that Challenger could perform a series of pretty lengthy burns. That's because Sir B worked best when in a far lower orbit. The initial orbit that Challenger launched into was a compromise between the Herbs team, who wanted to be up high, and the Sir B team who wanted to be down low. With Herbs now safely on its way, Challenger was free to lower its orbit over the next couple of days from around 350 kilometers down to around 250 kilometers. But, he knew there was a but coming, the antenna's latches weren't latching. First hinges, now latches. It seems the antenna didn't fold up quite as nicely as expected while in space, so it was going to need a little help. In another bit of don't-overthink-it engineering, the robot arm was once again put into action, gently pressing down onto the antenna and allowing the latches to snap into place. But there was also a bigger problem. A problem that would more or less go on to define this mission. The radar antenna produced a large amount of data, specifically 46 megabits per second. It just so happens that the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRS, was able to provide 50 megabits per second. How about that? It's almost like they planned it out. This meant that the radar could do its thing, mapping out big swaths of the Earth, while simultaneously beaming the data up to TDRS, which then beamed it down to researchers. Such high data rates require directional antennas with precise pointing, as opposed to hassle-free but low-bandwidth omni-antennas. Think spotlight as opposed to naked light bulb. This was accomplished with a steerable KU-band antenna that was deployed over the edge of the payload bay. KU-band is just the name of the part of the radio spectrum that this antenna used to talk to Tedris. This antenna could pivot from side to side, maintaining a connection with the Tedris satellite in geostationary orbit. Except no, no it couldn't. This KU-band antenna 
broke. Not only was it not pointing where it was supposed to, it wasn't even pointing in any direction in particular. It was just sort of flopping around. No matter, by manipulating a couple of jumper cables, the antenna could at least be locked into place so that its orientation would be known. The only catch is, the cable in question was behind the lockers at the front of the mid-deck. It's always something. So the crew, who had never trained to do this, had to start disassembling their spacecraft. They took apart the lockers, waited for the flopping antenna to be in a reasonable direction, messed with the wiring, and locked it into place. Now, at least, the antenna was pointed in one direction. Okay, new plan. Point the orbiter's payload bay down so that the radar antenna could do its thing, recording to some data tapes. When the tapes are full, rotate the orbiter so that the now stationary antenna points towards Tedris, and we can download the data. Switching back and forth was going to be a big hassle, but it was workable. Except there's one big issue you may have picked up on. Since they were basically using all of their data bandwidth already, it wasn't like the crew could just hit fast forward on the data tapes and get back to collecting radar data. Basically, for each minute collecting data, they had to spend a minute not collecting data so that they can then downlink the data they already had. Ugh, fine. It was a lot of extra work for the crew, and the scientists missed out on a lot of data, but it could have been a lot worse. The hope had been to collect around 42 hours of data, but in the end, only 9 hours could be collected. Scientists on the ground scrambled to replan contacts, scheduling data dumps over oceans where nothing interesting was going on, and making sure that all 40-plus investigators at least got some data. Oh, and in a quick aside, as if the pointing issue wasn't bad enough, the Tedris satellite itself had its own little problem, taking it out of service for 12 hours. Why was it out of service? Well, in order to help keep it pointed in the right direction, Tedris 1 would watch the horizon of the Earth, a handy way to track its own orientation. During the mission, however, Tedris 1 got a little confused when the moon rose. Not realizing that this was a different bright object, Tedris 1 faithfully followed the moon, turning away from the Earth and making life difficult for the folks at White Sands. Normally this wouldn't happen since ground controllers would note the upcoming moonrise and switch to a different horizon sensor. But, well, someone forgot. Space is hard. All of these antenna shenanigans also pushed the planned EVA from day 5 of the flight to day 7. There was a chance that the EVA crew would have to manually restow the KU band antenna before re-entry, so the spacewalk was bumped a couple of days to give the mission more time with the antenna deployed. Headed outside today were Dave Liestma and Kathy Sullivan. As I noted earlier, this spacewalk made Sullivan the first American woman to perform an EVA. The main task on this spacewalk was to evaluate the feasibility of refueling orbiting satellites, even ones that weren't designed to be refueled. In this case, a mock-up of part of Landsat 4 with an accurate recreation of the fill and drain valve was mounted in the back of the payload bay. Liestma and Sullivan would make their way back there, pull out a set of specialized tools, and attempt a simulated refueling. But wait, I hear you say. Didn't we talk about this a couple of times already? You're right. Previous flights have tested some aspects of on-orbit refueling. But what makes this time special is that they're playing with live ammo, or live hydrazine, which is actually a lot scarier. Hydrazine is a terrifying chemical that is super great for fueling the propulsion system of a long-lived spacecraft, and super bad for staying alive. Flammable, explosive, toxic, and with a tendency to melt lungs, it was very important that none of this stuff got back into the orbiter. If there was a leak, Elaborate procedures would be followed to use the sun to bake toxic residue off of the EVA crew's suits, and special respirators were waiting in the airlock just in case. The toxic aspect was scary, but the fuel was also scary since if something went wrong with the refueling equipment, there was probably enough hydrazine back there to blow the whole back of the orbiter off. Commander Bob Crippen initially pushed to do the experiment with a benign fluid like water, since it should adequately demonstrate the procedures. 
But while it was indeed scary to use real hydrazine, lots of stuff in spaceflight is scary. Engineers thought it out, addressed the risk, and convinced Crip that this was a safe activity to include on his flight. And if it was good enough for Crip, the refueling engineers must have really known their stuff. The benefit of using real hydrazine was that NASA could then turn to satellite owners, both government and commercial, and say, hey, we're not just saying we can do this, we've done it. To slightly modify a quote from legendary flight director Glenn Lunny, if you're going to transfer hydrazine in space, sooner or later, you've got to transfer hydrazine in space. In the end, it was one of these things that looks so easy, you almost wonder what all the fuss was about forgetting about the thousands of hours of planning and training that went into making it look easy. While Landsat 4 would never actually be refueled, this demonstration added one more important capability to NASA's toolkit when it came to satellite servicing. After an eventful eight days in space, it was time to come home. And the astronauts were going to get quite a view. For the first time, the shuttle's re-entry path would take it across much of the eastern United States, at a low enough altitude to have great visibility, while still traveling at bazonkers speeds. And it also meant that on his third attempt, the weather finally cooperated, and Bob Crippen closed out his spaceflight career with a nice, gentle touchdown at the Kennedy Space Center's shuttle landing facility. Over 8 days, 5 hours, 23 minutes, and 33 seconds, Challenger racked up 133 orbits and over 3 million miles on the odometer. Next time, Challenger's back on the launch pad with an unusual mission. Let's see, am I reading this right? It's going to launch with two communication satellites in the payload bay? And land with two communication satellites in the payload bay? That can't be right. Ah, I see. They're different communication satellites. Well, hang on, that's still pretty weird. What two commsats could we possibly be picking up and bringing home? Oh, hey! Palapa B2 and West Star 6. Long time no see. Let's see if we can't get you into that proper orbit after all. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.